Well, hello and welcome to episode 21 of Tui Snyder's Offbeat and Overlooked. This is a weekly streaming show where I interview a wide variety of experts about everything from cemetery symbols, forgotten history. We'll do a lot of overlooked history today, in fact. Folklore, paranormal activity, quirky travel sites. Sometimes we talk about UFOs. Basically, all the offbeat and overlooked people, places, and things that tickle my fancy. And as I always say, I have a very ticklish fancy. Now, in case you're new here, I'm Tui Snyder. I write books, I give talks, and I do a lot of research. And I see we have a couple people here. We have Scott and Sandra. So hi, guys, for showing up. Uh, and I think you guys were both here last week for my show with Ernie Kern. Uh, let me bring him up real quick. So in case you, you remember Ernie, I'm sure you guys remember Ernie. Ernie, what a sweetheart and what a trooper. Oh my gosh, if you guys were here last week, I know I really earned my nickname of Glitchy Woman. I was having so many glitches. And here's the thing, Ernie's 86 years old. And when I invited him to be on this show, he goes, honey, at my age, I don't even buy green bananas. <laughs> so he said he would be on. He was a little nervous though, he told me, because he didn't know how to use StreamYard. He, he's never, he just doesn't use the technology much. He never got into it. I mean, you know, you're 87, 86, whatever. And uh, so he had his grandson come over and they were all hooked up. I thought everything was going fine. And then, uh, well, what do you, if you were here last week, you know <laughs> how it all went down. We were talking, Ernie was just about to tell us the story about how he had adopted four baby bobcats because he had worked for Fish and Wildlife in Florida. And we were just kind of getting off the cemetery topic. And uh, all of a sudden my screen just went black. I mean, black. And luckily it wasn't the internet, but my power charger, my laptop, it just died. So everything's fine. My laptop's fine. I freaked out and it took me about 10 minutes to get back on. I logged in with my phone and um, Ernie was a trooper. He held down the fort. I came back, I re-listened to the show. He, he was fine. He, he could just co-host this show anytime. He was doing great. So I had to mention that. Now our guest today, who I'll be bringing on a little bit, is fellow Texan Arthur, author E.R. Bills. And I love him. He writes about a lot of the same topics I do. And so I know you guys are going to love him too. Uh, I have a link to his his uh, all his books on Amazon, because I'm only going to be talking about three of them. He's got a lot more books out than that. And yeah, you guys are going to really enjoy that. Now, before we get to him, I do want to remind everyone that I do have a recap and replay page on my website. So if you just go to my website, which is my name, tuisnyder.com, and then you go up, you'll see a thing that says show recaps and replays. And actually, I'm a little bit behind on that, but I have direct links to specific shows. And I tell you a little recap so you can kind of see, hey, what topics grab you if you want to go back. Um, so like our recent shows, we had Ernie on. And then the week before that, we had uh, David Castleton talking about all those really weird stuff over in churches. Um, we had the gargoyle expert on not that long ago. So you might want to pick through that. While you're there, this might show up. Um, and it'll be inviting you to join my newsletter. And if you do like these shows, then hey, join my newsletter because you will be in the loop. You'll know what's going on. Every send Sunday, I send out a newsletter with links to uh, stuff I've done and other interesting things. I let you know who the next show guest will be, so on and so forth. I, I try to keep it easy breezy, just give you just the facts, <laughs> what's coming up and maybe a little bit of fun. Now, I should tell you guys that, uh, before I forget, I should tell you guys that this is going to be my only show this month. Um, I am going to, I need to go up to the Pacific Northwest. My um, dad's in the hospital and there's just stuff, family stuff going on. So I, I don't know that I'll be able to do the show. I do have some plans though. There are some weird things to see up in that neck of the woods. So in my downtime, I might just, Keep an eye on my channel. Make sure you have notifications going because I might just randomly pop on. There are some, there's a very weird geological feature I'm hoping to go and show you guys. And then there are some really 
unique, interesting cemeteries, old cemeteries that I, I plan to pop in that are kind of in the, that neck of the woods too. So I won't be completely absent, but I won't be doing the weekly show just because it's going to be hard for me to know uh, when and where I'm going to be. You know, if I get a chance to go see my dad, I'm going to take it. Um, there's a chance I might not even be able to go in the hospital and give him a hug. I might only be able to wave at him from the ground floor window. So we're just going to see. Even if, I, if I'm waving at him from the window, that's still a lot more, a lot closer than Texas. Um, now, I, let's see. I see a few more people showing up. Oh, hey. Hi, Tony. Hi, Anton. Thank you for coming. Yeah, dad's doing all right. He's a trooper, but boy, it's, it's, it is worrisome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll do some updates and uh, keep everybody in the loop. I also want to remind you that um, I do have some other videos on my channel. I had a very thoroughly researched one about Memorial Day that has some interesting facts in it that you might want to check out. Uh, and I have another one about veterans graves. So these are kind of timely, you know, just dig around on my channel. If by any chance you miss me, <laughs> hopefully you guys are going to miss me. Oh, hey, hi, Gail. Thanks for showing up. Nice to see you guys. Always good to see everybody here. Hopefully it's going to be less glitchy. Now for the photos of the week, I have some that come from Scott, who is here with us, and he can help fill me in. And I didn't thoroughly research these, but I, I just thought they'd be kind of fun to show you guys. He sends me some cool photographs, as you know, on this show. Now these are some, there's a place in Ohio, the state of Ohio, state, old and sane, and penal cemetery. This cemetery was utilized by Franklin County for insane asylum burials and later for prisoner and indigent burials. We recognize the courage of past state hospital residents who lived with mental illness and inspired future understanding. Wow, you can ima imagine there's a lot of stories associated with this particular cemetery. And there were some strange markers there. Here's one that Scott shared with me. It's a little hard to read, but at first glance, it looks like it says specimens. But we were talking yesterday, and we kind of think it actually says specimen and then eight. So I don't know. I really wonder what that would be. A specimen? Like some organ? Like a leftover diseased kidney or something? I, I don't know. Very strange. So that's one that's worth it. <laughs> Let me know what you guys think. I'm just showing some of these things here. Here's another one. This one really raises a lot of questions too that I don't know what it's all about. Okay, we have Mar Marion or Marlon Waits died April, does that say 31? Because, you know, 30 days half <laughs> September, like in April, right? So I don't know what that is. Did the, the, the engraver have dyslexia? Is that supposed to be a 13? Uh, I don't know what is behind there, age 56. That's just another, that's very odd, a real puzzle, puzzler, head scratcher. I love it when people send me these weird markers that we can't figure out. Maybe we'll figure out, or maybe someone who's watching this will know what that is all about. And if you do, I appreciate it. Of course, every show I have to have a sponsor. <laughs> I just picked a movie poster again that relates a little bit to something we'll be touching on briefly um, when I talk to ER Bills. It's um, it's just that I, the, the town that dreaded sundown, and I'm pretending that that's my show sponsor. Of course, my real sponsor are my Patreon supporters. So that means Bob, Connie, Ian, Scott, Ghost Cat, Jessica, Angel, Anne, NVJ, Ken, Patty, Sarah, Julie, Margaret, Hugh, Mikhail, Naomi, Tim, Sarah, Rachel, and the other Tui who had no relation to me at all. So thank you guys for your support. <laughs> Appreciate it. And that's super creepy. I think this movie just came out not that long ago. I'm, I'm not that up on horror movies, and I know a lot of you guys in the audience are. So if you've seen it, let me know. Now, our, for our books of the week, I actually have a lot of books of the week for us. Usually I just have one, but this time around I have three because the reason I have these three is because they are all books by our guest, E.R. Bills. And he has a lot more books than these guys, not just the ones that I'm talking about, but let me just say you can check out all his books on Amazon. I hope you will. There is a direct link to his books in the description box below. So you can click on that. 
uh, you definitely will want to check out his books. And I have more than these three, but I thought I would just limit today's talk since we try to keep it to an hour around here. I don't, uh, I don't want to have all 20 of his books and try and make him talk about all of them. But yeah, you guys are going to love him. He's really interesting. I have a funny story. Okay, let me tell you, I've got these three books of his. And one of them's called Texas Obscurities. Let me bring it up so you can see it. Yeah, Texas Obscurities. And the first time I came across this book, I was spending the night at my friend's house. And uh, she, you know, I, I just couldn't get to sleep. Um, so, you know, I was like, uh, I just went over and I looked at her bookshelf. Of course, I always look at people's bookshelves. And I just, Texas Obscurities, what's that? I started reading this book. I could not put, put it down. The next day, I wasn't finished with it. I did manage to fall asleep. I was like, can I take this home? And I took it home with me and ordered her another copy from Amazon and had it sent because I was like, I just cannot surrender this book. I love it. Really great book. Um, and so this Texas Obscurities, it's just stories of the peculiar, exceptional, and nefarious. Really, uh, you know how I like to say that I used to write fiction, but then I moved to Texas. Uh, that's kind of similar stuff here. He, he, he finds some of the similar cool things. And I do want to ask him a bit about his research today. Oh, here's Scott. He's weighing in a little bit about those photos. I'm hoping to get there soon for more pics. It's right down the road for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you, when you get more pics uh, from that, maybe, maybe you can find the other specimens. You know, there's specimen eight. Maybe you can find specimen one through seven. Creepy. But yeah, maybe you can. And I will show your photos when you do that. That would be great. Now he has another book called Texas Far and Wide, and this one is just, well, more goodies from Texas. As you can see, he's very Tex-centric. <laughs> and we have Texas Oblivion, which really focuses on mysterious disappearances, escapes, and cover-ups. Really, really, all three books are very good. I love them. They have a prominent place on my whole Texas bookshelf. Hey, hey, Nicole, thanks for coming. Nice to see you here. All right, so without any further ado, I am going to tell you just a little bit about ER Bills, and then I'm going to bring him on so that we can just start talking to him. Let me get, I have a very brief bio for him. Um, so ER Bills, he received a BA in journalism from Texas State University. He does freelance writing for publications around the state. Like me, he lives in North Texas. He does a lot of research. Too, as you can as you can tell from the books that we've talked about and uh, he also does um, he edits horror horror anthologies uh, so if you like horror you're gonna want to check those out too uh, there's just so many books of his that we could talk about and and you guys you know you can ask questions along the way as you know but I'm going to bring him in here with me add him to the stream hey hey how you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm really excited to have you on. Now, let me ask the folks listening if they can hear us okay. Hey, guys, are we balanced okay? Are we echoing? Sometimes things are wonky and they can tell, but it sounded good to me. It sounded good, hopefully, on your end. I think I think we're doing okay. I, you know, what I did was um, I kind of cherry-picked a bunch of different topics from your books. <laughs> And we could just talk about them in as little detail or as much detail, just whatever you feel like. Um, and I, I would also like to, if we have time, just um, selfishly, just talk about like how you decide what you're going to write about next. Because I always think that's an interesting thing. Like what, maybe we could start with that. Like how did you get into writing about um, all these wonderful topics that you do? <laughs> like. <laughs> What, what drew you to these amazing topics and before we get <laughs> well, into it? Um, I had a pretty, a pretty serious journalism career at Texas State. I won a bunch of awards and, and uh, was fairly well accomplished. Uh, but I realized when I got out in the big old real world, I would, I would have to uh, – college journalism is a little different. You can do a lot of – there's a lot of room for creativity and, and – um, you know, when you when you go into professional journalism, there's there's dues you have to pay, and uh, you know, frankly, the subject matter can be limited because because professional journalism relies a lot on advertising dollars, which relies on business. Uh. And so, I had a hankering, or you know, sort of an interest in things that 
maybe might be unpopular. <laughs> and I didn't want to chase around an ambulance with the microphone or anything. And, yeah. and, and journalists do a lot of great work. Don't get me wrong. I have, have utmost respect. But uh, the university off offered me a, a, a graduate teaching assistantship. So I just stayed and taught for a year. And oh, then okay. after that, I decided I'd had enough. And so I went and lived in Austin for three or four years and, and then backpacked to Europe for several months. When I came back, I, you know, I met a girl, the same old story. Um, and we still <laughs> having kids. And so I, I wasn't really riding. I, I thought about things a lot, but uh, I just didn't quit riding. So after the kids were old enough, I started taking them camping around the state. And one of the first stories that, that jumped out at me, I'm, I think I, I'm a native born Texan and I thought I knew a lot of, a lot of the stories here, but I didn't. Um, so, so I was out running around with my kids and we'd go camping and we'd go someplace and I'd learn something new. And I think, I, I can't believe I've never heard that. So the, the best example is one of the first stories I wrote. Um, and I remember when I submitted to Texas co-op power magazine and they may be, are you a co-op power co-op you have for power? then you probably get that description um, for free. But anyway, um, the editor, I remember, said, after she read the story, she goes, who are you and where did you come <laughs> from? <laughs> wow. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean. What I story think, was think, this? No, it was around 2012, 11. I don't, I don't know. I mean, but I had, I mean, I really flew under the radar. I mean, my professors mm -hmm. in college thought I'd wind up writing for Rolling Stone or something. I mean, I just disappeared. So, <laughs> um, which is easy to do in Austin when you're young. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, so I went camping with my kids. Oh, yeah. So anyway, she's like, where did you come from? They, they were like, they couldn't believe, you know, that they hadn't, you know, what had I been doing? They, they kind of gave me the once over and I'm, I checked out, I guess, because they published the story. <laughs> but the story was the one about the bat bomb. It was oh, the one about yeah. where they, they uh, militarized bats. I mean, the, it was a project I called have... Project X-Ray that competed mm -hmm. with uh, the Manhattan Project to end World War II. And so I was just, we were just camping. Um, I think we were at uh, South Lono State Park. Oops. and uh, But we drove to Devil's Sinkhole. Mm -hmm. And so we were just there and taking a look at that. And uh, and there was a sign that said something about Project X-Ray. And I asked the attendant, the park attendant. So he started telling me the story. And I was just, my jaw just dropped. I was dumbfounded. I thought, I can't believe I've never heard this story. So <laughs> that's how it all started. I wrote about the bat bomb um, and how Louis Pfizer, the guy who later went on to, to invent, um, well, develop nap napalm, Mm -hmm. He first created miniature incendiaries attached to bats, which they were going to drop over to Japan, Tokyo, where most of the buildings were still comprised of wood, built of wood. And, uh, of course, the bats would roost and the incendiaries had timers. They would they would go off and burn down wow. Tokyo. <laughs> yeah, it's, with bats. It's, it's like a bad B movie. <laughs> it is. I know. It's, it's crazy. Bat bombs. It sounds crazy. Yeah. So it was it was it was kind of cool. And so I, I hadn't done it in a long time. And I didn't mm -hmm. think I think they may just send me packing because I hadn't written anything. And, and uh, well, I hadn't written any features. I, I'd been writing opinion stuff for Fort Weekly in South Texas, uh, mm -hmm. South Texas newspaper. No, no like feature stuff. So. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, they loved it. And so I wrote for them for a long time. Um, and that segues into what the other story I'd like to talk about, because you just, I didn't know you were from the Pacific Northwest. Oh yeah. So I had heard of these. I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah. The Japanese the balloon bomb. The Japanese, the day they bombed Texas. I had no idea any of them made this because when we would go camping like, or hiking in the Pacific Northwest, we were always warned you know, don't go off the trail. Be you want to when you're a kid, but yeah. you can tell them all about it. Tell us why you shouldn't go off the trail and all that and everything else. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's okay now, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we had our our secret bat bomb that I think was just a like I said, uh, maybe I'd love to see at some point go through old cold well uh, pre World War II you know spy files because it seems mm -hmm. to me after a while it may have been that. The United States kept the project going just for foreign spies to sink ah, their teeth into and distract yes. them from what was really going on. But it's just a it's just a theory I have. But mm -hmm. anyway, so 
the Japanese came up with a weird weapon of their own, and it involved children in elementary schools. They 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 created these they created these pretty good sized bombs that they decided they would send over the Pacific, utilizing the uh, the jet stream. And they had kids, you know, build like uh, macrame uh, casings and stuff to to basically carry these bombs. And 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 also they had them work on the actual casing around the balloon. So they would send these balloons up into the into the jet stream, and they would drift across. And they sent thousands, six or seven, eight thousand of them, and almost all of them fell in the ocean. They didn't make it. It was an interesting idea, but some of them did make it. And uh, I don't remember the dates on who and where what what happened. Matter of fact, I don't remember whether I don't remember whether one in, in I guess it was Oregon landed first, but. In Texas, a place called Desdemona, one day a bunch of kids came from school or they were headed home from school on a bus and a kid got off the bus and they saw this big basketball looking thing bouncing across the ground there in Desdemona, Texas, where there was only like 200 feet. And they thought it was cool. So they all ran over <laughs> and, were, <laughs> and stopped it. We're pulling on it. And, it, and uh, luckily there were no ammunition or sorry, munitions left on it, no explosives. But in the case that you were mentioning, in, I think it was in Oregon. Oregon, but anyway, I think so yeah, yeah, it landed and it still had munitions attached, mm. and that family of eight, I think it was five. really tragic. I think the dad realized. Yeah, but, but That's too late. So the kid horrific. was already over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Stop! Don't. I mean, I can just imagine. You know, you're trying to herd little kids. Yeah, they don't hear you, and then man, that just oh. But that yeah. one hit the target. Actually, they were at, the plan was to actually burn down the Pacific Northwest. Wow. Just demoralize the United States. Yeah. Um, it didn't really work out for him, but uh, anyway, another one landed in Woodall, out there in West Texas too. Yeah, I've, I've, or Woodsner, Woodall. Yeah, I've been up there once, and I did talk to locals to see if anybody. They're like, "What are you talking about, girl?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "Okay." I found a guy. I found a guy. Oh, you found I someone who remembered to. it? Oh man, yeah, I, I struck out. They just looked at me like, "What are you on?" <laughs> it's a crazy story. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, Japanese. Anyway, just fascinating Columbus, stuff Texas. like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love it. Well, I got more stuff. I pulled little clippings on just some of the stuff that you talked about. I'm just going to dig around here. No particular order. Oh, I love this story. This is a story that I learned from you. Um, if you could tell us a little about the, the boy with x ray eyes. <laughs> that was a really fascinating story. You know, a lot of these stories, and you and I have crossed some of the same paths, mm -hmm. you know, the or a spaceship crash. Oh yeah, like we can that. talk about that a little bit. But uh, I don't know that I, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't mm -hmm. know that I have a horse in sort of that race or even that corral on whether or not a, U, a UFO really crashed or UFOs even exist. Now, I am a person who is interested in the science of things and the, and the, the possibility, I mean, the chance that there's not other life out there in the universe seems to me that's, the that's cat. hardly possible. It's so big, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. So, but but when I write my stuff, mm -hmm. I mostly confine myself to the historical record. You Me know, too. this isn't somebody something somebody dreamed up on their back porch. I mean, there's historical record documenting some of this stuff. So well, and that's I get excited me. too. I get excited too about how did they think about it? Like in, in 1897, you have not seen all the gazillion space movies that I have seen. So I, I like to get an actual 1897 account. If something weird happened, how would I describe it? And some of my favorite descriptions were like a farmer said he thought he heard a large swarm of bees. Because just think you wouldn't have even heard very many engines or machines in your no. life. So I, I, to me, like the whole trying to get in the mindset of the past is part of the fun too. Like reading the editorials where people who hadn't seen anything, but they just naturally think it must be judgment day because of their frame of reference. So that kind of gets me. Well, I think they picked they they thought the visitors from that were possible the visitor that was possibly in the Aurora space crash space crash was from Mars I think yep. because because of the War of the Worlds oh hmm. or one of those books I can't remember which one but or no well, let, me, let me think about that for a second that was later the World War of the Worlds but um, they did just Mars and war have a long association I mean you know mythologically okay maybe it was there was some book. That talked about Mars, but I don't remember which one it was. But there was also a, a recent development in telescope test technology, and they had they had looked at Mars and they decided they thought there were canals on it. 
That was, so uh, yeah, the Italian Schiaparelli, yeah. Italian astronomer Schiaparelli, he means canale, which just means channel. But we hear canal in English and then a canal is full of water. And so things just lost, gained in translation. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Well, this boy is actually like that. Oh, okay. Um, Here, I'll bring him back. X-ray eyes, boy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, there was a there was historical record. There were researches in science magazines, and there was this kid from Texas that could basically a human Navani rod that supposedly see see water under the ground, and that's ex exactly the way to put it. And uh, he was sort of a fascinating character. And they say even John Dance Gardner, the former vice president of you know, the United States, knew this kid, referred people to this kid. Um, and eventually they say he wouldn't take payment for his, you know, for his services or for his abilities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they say that his dad started taking money, you know, on the side with unbeknownst yeah. to the boy. And they say when the boy found out that was the end of his powers, which is, you know, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I do wonder, well, here's a, I found a newspaper because in 1901, there's a whole bunch of stuff about him. And, you know, that guy Fenley, the boy with x-ray yep. eyes, and they talk about this. But then here we get to 1902, and they're like, whatever became of the boy with x-ray eyes uh, was oil of, you know, they're like, we, like he's disappeared. The boy with x-ray eye is now an X x ray boy. I <laughs> so think the I last thing he found was one of the big oil fields, and I think it was, well, they, I know they communicated with him about trying to find oil in, in, uh, in East Texas. I, I don't know. I, that story... It's been a while since yeah. I've looked at that one, but it was a fascinating, you know, just a piece of Texana. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I love that tale. That really, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Just the idea of x-ray eyes and that, yeah, he had that ability. You know, when I, um, shortly after I moved to Texas in 2009, my husband and I were driving to work one day because he had a boat shop and I worked there. Um, he, and I see like a crew, work crew, wearing work, you know, like like hard hats and the, the reflective vests and they have dowsing rods and they are going around and I'm like, <laughs> wow, wow. It still goes it? on. <laughs> it still does. It still does. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, oh, I thought this was really neat and I learned this from you and then I've subsequently heard that the very first usage of the term flying saucer actually dates to Texas and I tried and tried to find the original article in some of the online archives I dig around in, but I, I couldn't. So I had to just steal it from your book, but go ahead and tell us. <laughs> well, it's from the old uh, Dallas Times Herald, as I recall. And I think um, they, I think they, there's a paywall. Anytime I want to do Dallas stuff, I, I subscribe to their thing for $10 and then I spend a month really digging and then I unsubscribe because <laughs> it's going to cost me $10. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Believe me. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a strange little story. It was about a, a farmer that originally said was around Denison, but it appears now that he was actually maybe in North Dallas that uh, he went out one morning and he was, uh, I think he was going to hunt, and he yeah. saw this object in the sky that was real was sort of bright, and uh, he described it as basically, a, it was about the size of a saucer, you know, in the sky, so a flying saucer basically. And uh, <laughs> and this is 1878. This really right. predates the whole this is the Kenneth first Arnold. Flying saucer. <laughs> this is, I think that is so cool that it was, you know, yeah, yeah, it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you said we grew up in, you know, I grew up. I told you I grew up in North Texas, and, and you told me where you're living now, and also in North Texas. And it's when I grew up here, I thought it was really a boring place, you know, because Close Encounters of Third Kind, everything happened somewhere else. Yeah. The, uh -huh. the Bermuda Triangle was down there off the coast of Florida. The Yeti lived in the Himalayas. Uh -huh. You know, all this Loch Ness Monster was in Scotland. This was a boring yeah. place. Mm -hmm. It turns out, you know, this was UFO Central for about 100 years. It's where the first flying saucer was seen and, and the first and only space crash. Obviously, it has its own historical marker. It's fascinating yeah, stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's just talk about that a little. I know. Well, see, that's one reason that I write the books that I do is like, I think people spend unnecessary time when 
they, they're bored. They don't have to. I mean, there's so much interesting stuff, no matter where you are. Like wow. my little slogan is like, even home is a travel destination. But what I mean by that is like, yeah, you, you just start digging around. People get his books. You know, you're going to be like thinking all the cool stuff happens in Texas. But I mean, there's so much that's really interesting around here. Yeah, just we just got to show we've we've talked about the Aurora space crash before, but it's fun to see. Now, all there is is a big rock now. But when I first moved here, it was kind of a cool did you ever go up there? And I'm sure you did. You've been there and seen it. Right? Yeah, I, think I you, ran into. You oh, you wrote the, about uh, it a lot, so of course you have. I ran into you at the uh, was it the hundredth anniversary or whatever that first that first festival. Oh, 1997 would have been, I guess. But there was one. It, oh no, it wasn't then. It must 2016, have been they had yeah. a big thing. That was amazing. That was yeah, so I went fun. There. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> it was so it busy. Was I never got to leave my table. It was just like, that was like the best book conference I've been to actually, surprisingly. So if people go up there, that, this is what you'll see these days. You're just going to see a big old rock. But the first time I went there, um, people steal this photo of mine a lot. <laughs> it's funny. I can tell because I recognize the plant spot and I'm like, oh yeah, someone took my photo again. Um, one thing, have you been there recently to Aurora? Because this cracks me up. Have you been there lately? No, I, I haven't. I mean, really, probably not since since that uh, since well, that uh, anniversary thing. I was I drive we drive by there sometimes on our way to Denton. It kind of it's from where I live. It makes sense. So if you you guys who are watching might not realize it's like this is a blink and you'll miss it. Town population yes. four hundred or less, but now they they. Suddenly, and when I just moved to Texas, no one there really wanted locals were kind of sick of the whole Aurora space crash thing. Now this is their their town's logo, Aurora, a legendary Western town. They got a little, you know, saucer. They got a crashed saucer sculpture with a windmill. They the last time I was there, I think I drove by because I was getting my COVID shot. Um, they now they have this this place a barbecue place I forgot the name it has some they're turning into a little Roswell practically <laughs> they've got some sort of the barbecue place is supposed to be really good they make uh, like what are they called Martian yeah, they're, on it now. And they're totally in on it now they're totally in on it now now eventually I, I supposedly have a book coming out I've been working on it forever it's just one I, I don't know I, do you have some books that just are easier to launch and the other ones just come out I don't know. And if anyone watching this wants to learn more about it, I do have a, a little video about it. But um, but yeah, I, I I keep saying because it's one of those things that a guilty pleasure of mine is to um keep researching that. <laughs> so maybe that's why I've never released that book. I, I've got to get that one out. Anyway, strangeness. Let's see what else is there. I, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. Oh, I wanted you you mentioned that a sanctuary city for UFOs in Texas in your book. <laughs> Yeah, in Texas far and wide. Um, obviously, I kept going back to that too. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, how old am I? I'm 53. I'm about to be 54. But in the early 70s, uh, gosh, I was six or seven or eight. In the early 70s, a lot of books came out about paranormal things, and of course, I was fascinated by the Bermuda Triangle book. I was oh, fascinated yeah. by the Chariots of the Gods. And like I said, oh, yeah. Lockwood, that Lockwood movie, Swamp I saw Street. that as a kid. It scared me. Yeah. You know, Cole Shack, the Night Stalker on TV, which followed <laughs> after, you know, Twilight Zone and, you know, mm -hmm. Not Gallery. Um, yeah. Good stuff. There was this there was this real uh, period there in the early 70s where people were just people who wrote about this were making a lot of money. I mean, they, mm -hmm. I mean, those books sold like crazy. And so around that time. Yeah, Nixon was still in the White House. It was 73. And mm -hmm. that was right after uh, Chariots of the Gods came out. Um, mm -hmm. Well, this uh, this mayor down in Palacios, or Palacios, Texas, there on the, the South Texas coast. Let's see. Let me think about that. That is that yeah, is, that is west of, of Galveston and east of uh, Port Aransas. But anyway, um, he got this, this idea that... Uh, that he would create a sanctuary city. Sanctuary cities are like a hot topic there for a while in Texas politics. But yeah. uh, this was the first one proposed, and it was for, you know, basically extraterrestrial travelers. This mayor <laughs> said, you know, hey, you know, why, you know, why be uh why be afraid and why be oh, yeah, hostile? Let's give them, <laughs> yes. you know, a day where they can come and just stop by if they want to and and uh you know <laughs> so 
he he declared Palacios, Texas, the intergalactic capital of the galaxy for a day, and invited uh, space aliens to, to to drop by, basically, which is <laughs> I love this. an idea. And uh, mm-hmm. nobody showed up, unfortunately. But it was kind oh. of a hoot. Another reason they did that is because they had seen this big red blob, and I can see it. In oh yeah, big red blob. Yeah. Mm-hmm. During halftime of a football game. <laughs> what, what a dramatic time for a sighting. Yeah. I want to know more about that big red blob. I mean, yeah, that was really I have no thing. idea. What could that have been? And then they say it kind of detracted from the halftime festivities. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but it was like there were, there were several sightings in Texas over that year and a half, too. I had no idea. Years. And, yeah. uh, and there, I cover them in the chapter, you know, that, that what kind of led to. Yeah, I was reading that. That was a great chapter. I was like, I had no idea because now, you know, there's a lot of hoopla right now with all the supposed disclosure going on. And I'm like, I didn't know there was such a flap in 1973. Uh-uh. No, in I, it, it was a fascination with it. And that's when, was it, I can't, I can't. MUFON? MUFON was created, yeah. Oh, oh okay. or, or that's when it picked up speed. I can't remember. I'd mm-hmm. have to. Well, and that's when the whole, it kind of makes sense now that that's when the Aurora space alien crashed from 1897. It suddenly popped back up. I was always like, why 1973? I knew that Bill Case and and Jim Mars, but like, why did they suddenly get into it? Now, connecting this stuff. Thank you. See, maybe that's why I haven't put my book out yet. I needed to learn that. I don't know. And they also brought up, they also brought up, you know, the fact that whatever that they picked up, you know, weather balloon or spaceship, whatever they collected in Roswell, of course, they brought back to Carswell Air Force Base. Yeah. And that's so they, just that, right that's by something me. that sort of mm-hmm. tied in and they started talking about that and mm-hmm. Aurora, you know, and whether there was some synchronicity yeah. <laughs> uh, coincidence. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. It's fascinating stuff. It is, it is. It's just I love all the the weird, weird and wonderful wacky. Do I have any more in that? I guess I don't. Yeah, we talked about fat bombs. I don't know. I have everything in just kind of random order in here now, I suppose. It doesn't just, matter. Just shoot. We're just, off. yeah, we're just jabbing, jabbering around. I just thought that was neat. I, I See, what I love about your books is they make me want to, you know, they kind of send me down more rabbit holes. Like, they make me want to travel to these spots, which I think is great. I like that your yeah. books inspire me to go see these places. And then they make me like, oh, I want to learn more about them. So I think that's job well done with, with what you writing if you get people to well, do that. Thanks. Okay, well, obviously I see your books on the the Texas travel list, the best the Amazon bestsellers, because when I see mine on there, yours are illegally yeah. around. But, I'm like, hey I know him. <laughs> but Austin, the Austin Austin travel guide, Austin Texas travel guide, Texas Obscurities is like always in the top one hundred because I think it is something people read and they mm-hmm. think, you know, I'd like I, to go and look at that. I couldn't put it down. It in the introduction, really, I basically yeah. talk about that. There's all mm-hmm. these roads. And you just don't know what is at the end of of this one or that one. Which one do you take? Yeah. There's a mystery down every every back road. Oh, you know, one thing that you had. See, I was pretty new to Texas when I read um, Texas Obscurities. Like I said, I could not put this book down. Guys, if you want a, a good place to start on as many books, start here. But really, any place is good. But um, you talk, and this really thing that scared me, you talk about... Um, Oh, I forget what the name of the chapter is, but like um, about how it got to so hot, like 140 degrees briefly. Satan in Storm. That, Satan Storm. Yeah. I was yeah, like, Satan no, Storm. no. I was already, I think I was like <laughs> dying from the heat already. It was only 90. And I'm like, no, tell me this can't happen. I was like totally freaked out. How did you find out about that? <laughs> well, um, actually, my aunt, um, her name's Alta, and she mentioned it. We were talking about, Weird Ooh. stuff, and we were talking about my family because where Lake Whitney is now, I think it's a, it's at the confluence of the Biloxi and Brazos Rivers or something. I can't remember exactly, but that's where my my forebears were, and basically it's underwater now. Oh. You know, we I had a I had a forebear named Papa Walls, actually Edgar Allen Walls was his name, oh. and he uh, he sold the family place. Or basically, government bought it from us. So they can build that dam, and and Caperol or Caperol, I get that mixed up. Is right down the road, and so they remembered the story. And so she oh. mentioned I did some research, and then I found out that a much beloved weatherman here in Texas and Fort Worth, especially Harold Taft, he'd written a book about Texas weather, and it had mm-hmm. a chapter on it. So that's where I started. Oh, okay. It was just a fascinating. Um, well, yeah, I'm like, oh my event. god, give me a break! No, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. just wrong. <laughs> yeah, 
I can't imagine, you know, it's like a, another bad B movie, you know, Devil's Reign oh, or something. I don't know. Yeah, this you could turn these all these into like really a lot of the things you write about you could turn into interesting stuff. B movies. Yeah. But I mean that's just that just is like crazy. Who would ever think it could get that hot? I mean it feels that hot to me quite often. Uh 140 degrees is something. I, else. I don't even I don't want to be able to We're talking to about that. radiators <laughs> boiling over and, and those swamp coolers collapsing and the walls peeling and you oh just can't make gosh. that up, you know? And, no. And oh. there were actually pictures of the crops. I mean, they're just... Oh, wow. Just... They're all just dry, withered, mm. flat. Wow. And so there's a, there's a ton of stuff. And yeah. The, as yeah. you said, it, you don't have to dig that deep. There really is a lot of interesting stuff around. No, we, it's a very fascinating place. In Rhode Island, there wouldn't be enough room for both of us. Yeah. But here in Texas... <laughs> here in Texas... Oh, I love there, that. There, yeah. We probably need six or eight more of each of us. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, that's true. We've got a lot of ground to cover. I mean, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> this stadium big enough for the two of us. <laughs> this story I really like, too, you have in here, because people always talk about, um, you know, it was like a train wreck. You just couldn't take your eyes away from it. I kind of wonder if that saying originated with this whole thing. I got a whole bunch of newspaper clippings to go along with it if you want to tell us about it. Yeah, you're talking about the crash at Crush. And basically that was a PR event. Uh, you know, a, a train, I don't think it was a conductor, but I can't remember what he was. George Crush was his name. Um, yeah, what a great he came name up with this too. idea that I mean, yeah. They were retiring old old in, old uh, train railroad train engines and he came up with this idea. He said, you know, we should take two and and run them into each other. As a publicity event, so for one day, and I don't remember the date. Was it '97 again? Oh, I think show. It, was it was. It was 1896. Yeah, it was. Yeah, in okay. And I like this. Collision was a success. Like you don't yeah. expect those two words to be. Hey, woohoo! They were completely wrecked. Yay! <laughs> and uh, Thomas Edison was there with his early version of the kinetoscope. You know, the first motion oh, yeah. picture filming uh, piece of equipment. Um, but anyway, they they took these two. These two uh, the engines and they they separate them I think by a mile and with cars and they had the crowd back up I think like Here's the, like a drawing not <laughs> far enough <laughs> yeah uh, not far enough hundred yeah. yards or hundred mm -hmm. feet I think they said three hundred uh, feet is what I was know, reading they, of course, they crashed them together mm -hmm. and those boilers exploded. And eight or nine people died. Metal flew everywhere. Yeah, they kind of don't mention that. Collision was successful. <laughs> a lot of people died. But hey, the trains were wrecked. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty nutty. Uh huh. But like thousands of folks showed up. And for one day, that's right. Th before that town they hit. was crushed. Mm -hmm. It was the second largest city in Texas. It, yeah, I think even more, they expected thousands, but I think they got even more than they expected. Right. And they didn't expect the boilers to explode because right. they did. And one of the, I was reading about all the injuries. The one that got me was there was a photographer who got a bolt went into his through brain. The eye. Yeah, through the eye, and he lived. Yeah, like, crazy. Yeah, people were in trees and it hit people with trees. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've written about that a couple of times. It's it's a it, fascinating. Story. Yeah, I mean, you know, it is a train wreck. You can't keep your eyes away. Here's like the crowd at the wreck. Yeah, that must have been a pickpocket's heaven. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I like that um, Scott Joplin wrote a a song about it, the Crush Collision, which which includes. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. Sure, sure, yeah, it's it's incredible. It was Scott popular. Joplin. It hit the popular. You know, it was a big deal. It was a big seller, but it's right there. If you're going down I thirty five north or south, uh -huh. it's right there where that check stop is. Oh, I've seen it on Roadside America, a thing about it. Like, here's where the claim, but, you know, yeah, yeah I've the not been there. Where they have the, you know, oh, the, the sausage oh, and the, yeah, and the and That's oh, where it was. That's where, that's the crash where it was. Oh, I've been there. Oh, I didn't realize that's where it was. Like oh. a half mile mile from there, that's, that's what used to be crushed. Now it's called West. That's where oh, it's, I, hate sure. to, hate to be, I hate to be morbid, but no, but I remember was, West. Mm -hmm. The factory that blew up, you know, here a year or two back. That was that was the same same town. Same and area. you know, and that's the thing about Texas is confusing because West is kind of South Central, Eastland is right. kind of West Texas. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> the names don't tell you really where they are. <laughs> oh well, it's all yeah. relative. But yeah, poor West. Wow, they've had some explosions, haven't they? But yeah, this thing, this one where wow, right? Who, this guy, he sure got some great photos. 
They never yeah. recovered the footage from the, the mm. Edison, you know, uh, the guy who was filming. Oh, wow. He, he was, was shaking so bad by the time they, <laughs> by the yeah. time it ended. I don't know what, whether it was worth probably watching, but it was, yeah. it was quite a thing. I've written about it for uh, Texas Co-op Power and Fort Worth Magazine and stuff. And it, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a good one. I can see where you could approach it from different angles too. There's so much to it, really. You probably, I could see where you could have, Pretty different articles about the same event. Yep. All right. What do I have here? I don't remember. Oh, I know you don't cover this into too much detail, but I did want to talk about the Phantom Killer just a little bit because I know you're a horror fan, and I I know a lot of people in my audience are a horror fan. And there's like in that you, you approach this a bit in your book, but you don't go too deep into the, the Phantom Killer himself. But I I, I don't. Know. I can help you out with that. So that movie okay. poster that you showed that yeah that uh, pretend sponsored you. That's oh, the yeah. remake. That's a remake of a movie made in the seventies called *The Town That Dreaded Sundown*, which was a very oh, okay. successful, low-budget film, mm -hmm. um, and left an impression on a lot of us. Uh, but anyway, I need to see it now because it's about Texarkana, allegedly, I guess, or maybe yeah, I yeah, no, it happened. I feel like I should. Um, but anyway, um, it was in the forties. I don't remember the exact year. Yeah, but this, forty-six. I got forty-six. It. This guy, mm -hmm. he started killing folks there in the Texarkana area. He was harassing, you know, couples, and uh, the first one. Yeah, it's, just like the, it's like scared. the urban legend about the, exactly. the the lovers' lane, but it's true. Everyone always yeah, it's all true. The, I always thought that was until I heard of this and read about it. I was like, what? I thought that was just always an urban legend. But no, no, no. They they killed. I think he killed two or three couples, and yeah. uh, of course they never found him. But there's a lot of stuff that like 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 that yeah. here. I mean. Mm -hmm. I hate to hark back to the 70s. I mean, this well, was, maybe this, this is the was 70s one, I think. Yeah, yeah. Cool. This was scary stuff. Mm -hmm. But something else was going on in the 70s and something that changed. Okay, so you have horror fans. I'm a Halloween fan. Okay. And so oh, okay. in the mid-70s, you know, again, I'm a young, I'm a young kid, you know, uh, 75, I guess it would have been eight. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't remember what year in the 70s, but in the 70s, there was a trick-or-treating incident where some kids were poisoned. Yeah, right. by their parents. Right. Actually, but they, they, didn't know that they don't know time. that at the time. Everyone gets scared. They didn't know that. Mm -hmm. so, so for like a year or two, people were scared to let people go out and trick or treat. Yeah. And, and it's all because of this one dad there in Houston. Yeah. Was this oh, and it Houston. happened. That happened. The origin of that was a Texas thing? It's Houston, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. See, there's another thing. So there's See, that's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm you. telling you. Oh, I'm like, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of weird, you know, Ooh. stuff that goes on here. And then, of course, probably the most famous cannibalist or the cannibal horror movie is uh, oh, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, yes, yes. And which kind of happened, too. <laughs> Not with yeah. the chainsaw. But <laughs> oh, I know. I think they serve that stuff at, stuff at Bucky's now. Ew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I thought this was interesting in... Um, Town that dreaded sundown. Charles Pierce did the movie in Texarkana. Yeah, this is the one. Okay, I, I figure some people in the audience, especially people from Texas, have seen that or are familiar with it. I thought this was interesting. The FBI released a bunch of files on the Phantom Killer, as this Texarkana guy was known as, in 2020. I didn't so know that. here's a uh, yeah. His I found it just chilling for some reason to see the suspect's hand. Looks like a pretty large hand to me, but um Yeah, it does. Well there there in the seventies, like I said, there was like mm. this stuff came together and I was talking about, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and this Halloween thing. Yeah. The other thing that happened in the seventies, and you may not remember it, I don't know, you're not a horror fan, mm. some of your audience will. There was a movie that came out in the seventies and it was what really kicked off well, it didn't kick it off, but the whole Bigfoot thing. It was called The Legend of Boggy Creek. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. and it, it happened mm -hmm. down Arkansas, Texas, mm -hmm. you know, Boggy Creek yeah. runs across 45. Mm -hmm. um, I like monster stuff a lot. I'm, I'm a little more scared of like flasher stuff. stuff. I don't, eh, I'm scared to watch. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. So all that, ah, interesting. So the 70s really kind of brought up a lot of stuff. Okay, let's see what else do I have here. I have, oh, you know, um, oh, here. I, she lived in Texarkana at the time of the making of the movie. Oh, wow. So we're local. Yeah. Uh, did locals talk? I wonder, Gail, I mean, I bet locals uh, back then, there were locals maybe whose parents had remembered that whole scare. I mean, there had to be. 
There had to have been. Wow. Huh. Were you an extra? I wonder. In that. <laughs> it would have been fun to be an extra in that day. Um, I thought this was neat. I had never, I didn't, I feel like I should have known this, but hey, I didn't grow up in Texas. Um, the Walled Kingdom. Can you tell us about that? Because I found this really fascinating. If you could find five Texans, okay. Mm -hmm. all, if you could find five that mm -hmm. knew about it before my book, you know, I'll, I'll buy you dinner. Oh, Nobody really? knows about it. it, it oh, totally good. Okay, so lost. I don't feel, okay. I don't because, feel you know, the, the, King, the King Ranch, you know, hey, mm -hmm. that's the King Ranch edition Ford truck. I mean, it's like this part of Texas pride now. Yeah, everyone but basically, talks about it's that. all a it's all a snow job. It's all. I mean, they uh, were they were mm -hmm. they were a scary group, and the people they were lived down there around them. Creepy. That whole chapter was so creepy. Very creepy, and they the people around them didn't like them, didn't care for them. And one time, a group of Texans talked about invading the King Ranch because, mm -hmm. well, several Mexicans. Yeah, and tell Americans us about it. Tell us there. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, what yeah. happened was. In 1936, in November of 1936, kind of in the middle of the Depression, um, a family, a white family, that lived an Anglo family that lived next to King Ranch. Uh, the father and son crossed the fence to go to a tank post to shoot a couple or shoot a goose for dinner. Yeah, um, like Thanksgiving or something. They just needed yeah, some meat. Yeah, it was close now. to Thanksgiving. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, uh, and they had talked to one of the fence riders, I think, about it. They were friendly mm -hmm. with them. But anyway. They never and tell show people back what up a at their fence house. rider is. People might not know what a fence rider is. Well, on these big, well, mega ranches, you know, you had people hired to, 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 to ride the fence line to make sure, you know, the fence wasn't damaged and that, you know, people weren't, I guess, coming into the ranch. And I'm looking for it was different duties. It, yeah. it was a million acres. It was a million acre ranch. So Sheesh. anyway, mm -hmm. they acted like they acted like a kingdom and they treated the people around them like you know, feudal peasants. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it didn't go over well. And so this, well, let me backtrack even further. Other people had disappeared there, but they had all been Mexican or Mexican-American. And there was no, I mean, that's, of course, problematic, but there wasn't a big uproar about that. But when yeah. this, this Anglo uh, respected uh, citizen mm -hmm. there uh, disappeared with his son, mm -hmm. people, people in the community really became oh, suddenly it matters yeah yeah mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. they were gonna they had a hundred people they were gonna they were gonna cross the uh the, mm -hmm. the county sheriff down there they were gonna take on the texas rangers they were gonna invade the king ranch wow. try to find these two people mm -hmm. and uh you know they've they've never turned up and uh the, the the government of texas you know sort of took the side of the ranch and nothing was ever really done about it. Nobody was it's ever very really half assed uh, investigation from what it's then Yeah. And then like, the people yeah. who did try to investigate or, or special investigators hired by the family, they were harassed and arrested on bogus charges. So it's a crazy Jeez. story that nobody's had never heard. I've never heard. I've and, never uh, heard of it. Okay, good. So yeah. King ranch, you know, they, good for you bringing it up. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. That's why if you, if you read the chapter, you know how to start off about talking about, you know, Ford. Why yeah. would Ford, King Ranch, hopefully that's not emblematic of what people think we are. <laughs> yeah. Because they're monsters in their own right, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that some a lot of folks have King Ranch edition trucks. They may not like the story. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, I know, but it's good that they know. Yeah, you gee, what the source of that is. It's it's really different than what I had heard. You know, what yeah. I, I was yeah, like, oh all, yeah, King you Ranch. See the TV some, commercial. We're like, oh, that's a neat, oh, King Ranch is some big deal. But then like, it's this walled kingdom, essentially. They a felt like they, they really, and people just disappearing. And so they finally, in 1941, uh, um, tell us what happens. They finally, like. Well, what happened, happened was at the time, if you, the King Ranch was a million acres. It was so big, you had to drive 150 miles out of your way to get down to Brownsville. And so <laughs> wow. that was another thing that people didn't like about, about the ranch. But mm -hmm. The government, uh, state officials had tried to cut a highway through there for years and they couldn't get anywhere. But after this bad yeah. publicity, after this incident, you know, the King Ranch had to kind of, you know, acquiesce. Mm -hmm. And uh, but just think if it had been kind of off the main route, it might still be untouched. Right, you know what I right. mean? It, in a way, it's good. It was kind of you. We do. We, I, you just drive right through it. But now, but yikes! Yeah, before you had to go all. But I mean, I was really. It was a fascinating story, and I, oh, it is. I was really excited to write it because yeah, nobody's really talked about it for a long time.
it was shocking to me. I was like, what on earth is, how did I not know anything about this? Well, now I know it's just not widely known. Well, good. I'm glad you're writing these things. You need a, you need a YouTube channel. Do a little, um, do little bits about your, I'm not as, you your, know what? You're, hmm? you're, you're photogenic. You're spunky. You're energetic. I'm, I'm a tree sloth. It's bald. Oh, <laughs> it's about the con content <laughs> i know I'm, I'm perky but i get excited about this stuff. i know i, I know say. that's good you need that but i'm kind of know, a but... <laughs> dark you know person <laughs> i'm not maybe we I'm could better, i'm better on paper too we this should co-host something no i like but i'd like i just want more people to check your stuff out i think it's great <laughs> Oh my goodness. So when we talked about Boggy Creek, did we, we didn't really get into the Lake Worth Monster Munch. I just thought I would bring it up a little bit because it's fun. Oh, it's a great story. Now, I got I got to backtrack a little bit yeah. about that because I told you that I grew up here in the Fort Worth area. But I also, more importantly, I went to Camp Carter there oh. on Lake Worth. And that's oh, where okay. I learned about the Lake Worth Monster. That's a ghost story that they tell. Oh. Oh, oh, for sure. And I, you know, it, it just everybody's like riveted and oh, oh yeah, no kidding. Afraid to be away from the lights. And, I uh, bet it scares everybody. It was fascinating. Uh, Lockworth, stuff. I liked that. Somebody called it Lockworth. <laughs> oh yeah, and they call it the the what's it? They call it all kinds of things, but the Goat Man. Mm -hmm. But uh, what happened was in I think it was in late '69. Yeah. Uh, a, 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 a two couples were double well. They were on a double date there at uh, Lover's Lane or, you know, Inspiration Point, whatever they called it. There mm -hmm. were different names for it. And something something fell out of the trees onto the, the hood of their car. And oh, they described yeah. it as a furry goat man. Um, you know, said it had fins, said it had fur. I know, I love it. It's furry and scaly. I'm like, what? <laughs> I know, like, man. That sounds like something being be in Australia. You know, in Australia, yes. maybe I'd leave that creature <laughs> But it and it might be in Australia actually, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, it uh, it scared the pajamas out of them. The police came and investigated it. Um, Hi, Sandra. And then supposedly they saw it again. People, you know, teenagers started staking the place out. And supposedly yeah. they saw it again the next night. And then uh, and then the police came out there the night after that. And so you had police and supposedly this figure, this 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 Lake Worth monster. Mm -hmm. It throws he shows up and he's on this—he's on this ridge and he takes a tire and throws it like yeah, 300 yeah. yards at them. I like you know? that. The tire. So they have like the right. sheriff testify or sheriff deputy <laughs> testified. He saw it and all mm -hmm. these people saw it. You know, it turns out he threw it quite away, but then it got a good bounce and then oh, and that was just rolling. Well, like, but it rolled it down at him. <laughs> you know. Anyway, it's it's just a fascinating story and it, it and is. it captivated the mm -hmm. well. Really, you got national headlines. People were reading about it in Vietnam, but. Um, it uh, got grabbed a lot of attention, mm -hmm. and it's it's just a fascinating story. Now it is it's another one I don't uh, I don't have a horse in that race, but yeah, the actual the actual newspaper record and the studies that have been done about it are fascinating. <laughs> you know what? I think if you if you go out to that Lake Worth, mm -hmm. uh, oh, to the to the, the Fort Fourth Nature <laughs> Refuge, <laughs> yeah, and you're out there at night, mm -hmm. it's uh. You might have, if you're skeptical, you might. <laughs> it's a strange place. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. So, but it's it's a neat it's a neat story. And uh, anyway, have he, you ever? Oh, go ahead. Bigfoots claim him. The Bigfoot people, the cryptozoologists, yes. mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. claim the Lake Worth monster, and I guess rightfully so, as a, as in an actual case. And they they a lot of times you'll see that story I wrote for Fort, I wrote a story about it for Fort Worth uh, magazine. Oh, okay. And that's what started the whole Lake Worth Monster Fest again. Um, oh, neat. Oh, I didn't know you were responsible for reviving that. Yeah, that, that, was, that was 2009. People oh, that's right when I moved here. So I didn't realize who you were. I probably read it then. So did you ever, that was really good. Thank you for reviving that. That was great. I, I have to ask, did you ever see the play, the musical? No, but I talked to him. I oh, did you did? Interview. I want to hear the music. Oh, yeah. Oh, that is he's neat. neat. He's a neat guy. He's a, he's a really cool guy. Um, Johnny John. Simmons and his yeah, wife. Yeah, I want to meet him. That is really neat. I think they're it's cool. still they're still they're still going out there. They're in well, a I should different try. spot than they were, but yeah, he it had an impact on him, and he wrote about it. And mm -hmm. It's pretty neat. And then you drew a picture of it. Yes, I did. I love it. From so my, <laughs> you know, uh, I uh, actually studied commercial art before I studied journalism, and I wasn't. I was pretty good at the abstract stuff, but not yeah. really not as talented as some of my friends and. But I, I had a 
you know, uh, a connection with sort of with Lake Worth Monster. It's always fascinated me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wrote a song about him. It's not Did done. <laughs> it's, it just, I don't know where it came from, but I just, it, was, it just, I was starting putting lyrics to it. And it, it, the song, the, the whole bit of the song ends up being this girl who's a misfit. She meets the Lake Worth monster when all this is going on and they leave town together at the end of the song. And that's why no one's seen him anymore because they're both a couple of misfits, but they hit it off. <laughs> that's a great idea. I'll tell you, there's a, we have some horror fans on and there's a great movie called No Such Thing. And it's shot uh, in uh, Iceland. So oh, basically, uh -huh. it's about a Lake Worth monster, or sorry, Lake Worth monster type figure mm -hmm. who basically has been alive since before humanity. And there's a scene in it where he he's just beat down. He's kind of a drunk. He's tired of humans. Oh. He's mm -hmm. tired of the noise. He's tired. Of, basically, the plot. I can imagine you would get if you're happens. immortal. Yeah, you got to get a little. Things got to get a little old. <laughs> but when he's talking about it, he says. When you pe when you people first showed up, I should have eat I should have eaten you then. I should have stopped the whole race. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> but is it's, so funny. it's actually really cool, and it's got. Uh, What's it called then? It's called No Such Thing. No such. No thing. such thing. Okay, oh, okay. I'm gonna it, write it down. Uh, I might have to watch a few horror movies now. Now I want to see this. It's really good. It was it was uh, no written and directed thing. by Hal Hartley. It's got Julie Christie, and it's oh, got cool. uh, you know the, the who's the, who's the famous. Oh man, I can never remember the one in Cook the Thief and Her Lover. Have you ever seen that? Oh, um, she played. I don't know. No, Queen blanking. Elizabeth. Well, I'm Meryl blanking Street? too. No, the British version oh. of Meryl Streep. Um, uh, well, I don't know. I'm blanking. <laughs> well, anyway, she's a good in, actress. There's, there's a lot of really good, talented, uh, wow, people in it, and it flies under the radar. Well, you know, that's you know, you got to point these things out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here's something I forgot to, I had in here to talk about. This is something that I just, so you were talking a little bit at the beginning about how, um, you know, being in journalism and, and having a hard time propo maybe proposing some topics. Um, this is something that like, I, I kind of had that happen. I would pitch articles when I first moved to Texas to like magazine editors. And a lot of times they'd be like, what? No one wants to hear about, you know, the Salt Palace. Tell us more about barbecue or whatever. So yeah. Anyway, the Salt Palace. You could tell us. Which about that obviously well. wrote about in Texas Far and Wide. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating place too. I mean, I think they stole it from the Indians, but <laughs> from the, oh, the Native Americans at the time. But it's uh, it has supposedly it has enough salt there. The salt dome with enough salt to last us another twenty thousand years, even yeah. if current consumption. But what was really cool and would have been cool 60 years ago is they mm -hmm. used to take the kids on field trips to the to the tunnels that they they tunnel into this salt dome and they had big old trucks and you could go yeah. down in there. And uh, I know I would love to. So this is over in a place called Grand Saline and their visitor yeah. center is made of salt. And it was originally built in 1936 to it look like an Alamo. Um, it was made of salt. But now, but now it's, it's not it's rock. Oh, really? Yeah. But you oh, can still buy those salt crystals. Oh, okay. Because when I was there, it, I never licked it, though. I was with someone who licked the walls. I mean, here's the wall. Yeah, one wall. You're right. One wall is made of salt. That's right. Yeah, I mean, because it's it, they've rebuilt it a couple times. Because at first, they didn't yeah. even have a cover on it. Now it's covered with, you know, so it doesn't just get big rained wall. on. You would think about a big old salt lick out there. I always wonder, like, does every deer come? Like, here's a big old chunk of salt. They got <laughs> yeah, there. I don't like, know. <laughs> It's a weird but yeah. town, Grand Saline. But. Grand Saline, what a weird place. But there's a big salt mine. You can't, I wish I could have, like, I would love to tour that. That is a Oh, yeah. Place. But unfortunately, they don't give tours anymore. No, and this lady, for, insurance, I, for insurance purposes. But it was, yeah. You, you can see pictures of it. Big mm -hmm. old massive Tonka truck looking things, two stories tall, driving in there. And uh, there's like a guy standing next to it. Mm -hmm. you're like, Whoa. I mean, there really are some cold. salt mines around the world that you can visit. Um, there's some where they... There's one in Sicily where they've they've carved the uh, the miners have carved made a church in a little chapel in one area and they've carved That's very things neat. and you know so I thought well but of course you know sadly I guess because of lawsuits and stuff they won't let right. us down at the I would just love to go down there sometime though but uh, Gail I guess we're giving Gail England some flashbacks Texan flashbacks taking a stroll down memory lane she says yeah have you been to the Salt Palace sounds like she must have. And this lady, I love her name, Nana Lou Bailey. She was the hostess at the Grand Saline Salt Palace for a long time. 
there's little nooks and cranny places like that all over the place. Another place that, that reminded me of was uh, mm-hmm. in, uh, oh my gosh, I- 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 Iran, Texas, I R A A N. Oh, I've never um, been there. Well, that's where uh, the guy who created the comic strip, Ali U. Oh, really? That's where he got the idea. Oh. And from a cave. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a, that sounds like another one, another one worth checking out. Yeah. For sure. The cave's still down there, and they have a mm-hmm. museum with Ali Oop and his big, his big mastodon or whatever the dinosaur that followed him around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, how funny! And yeah. It all started there. Wow, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, you find some really interesting things. Now, I've got to say, okay, have we? I want to warn people we're at it's ooh, we're five after five. We kept you over a bit. Now, if anyone has questions for ER, no, now's the time to ask them. Um, so bring them up because we've kept them quite a while here. Don't want to keep them too much longer. I'll leave you, uh, let people give them a little chance because if I just, it takes people a while to type their questions in. But um, no worries. And I wanted to ask now, um, what are you working on now? Or can you talk about that? Or do you want to talk about that? I don't know. You know what? I'm really. Uh... I have, I have two books under under contract with two different publishers, mm-hmm. and I don't know if I'm actually going to do either of them. I'm kind of at a, you know, the Cross last road. year has been very trying, <laughs> and yeah, Ooh. and uh, mm-hmm. I've uh, I've been a little frustrated, and now I have well, obviously, Tex Oblivion book is out, and mm-hmm. the marketing, the publicity is all rolling out slow because there's a big log jam and. It's very, uh, it's very frustrating, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do at this point. I may... so, like, this book is the one that you really, um, I think, like true crime lovers will really love this oh, one. Yeah. This one um, you, you focus on mysterious disappearances and hoaxes and things, and you, I love it. We were talking a little before we got online, and you were saying you think you even may have figured out, like, connected all the dots and figured out who who done it on one of them. Oh, that's right. There's a, there's a there's a case where I won't make you say too much about it. But someone yeah. some <laughs> someone disappears, and and basically, uh, there's a relative that I talked to, and we basically, it's pretty clear who did the who who Oof. disappeared the person, and and uh, and I, I you know when you write a book like that, you think I, I want to solve this case if I can. Oh and yeah, we mm-hmm. can get lost instead of finishing the book. You can be you know six months later, you're still working on trying to solve this case. So I was really interested in that one particular case, and I thought I pretty much had it solved. And I even spoke to the police about it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and they said, well, why do you think this? And I said, because this, this, and this. And they said, well, that timeline is not. I said, yeah, it is because of this. And, and then all of a sudden, they're like, well, can you send us, you know, what you have? You know, what, what suggests that to you? So, so this cold case guy here in Texas, uh, in this county, I send it to him. And I haven't heard back, but... Uh, you know, hopefully yeah. eventually they'll solve it, you know. And, and you know, uh, it's interesting though. Okay, so like you're doing kind of, I mean, it's detective work in a way. And you're it doing is it's, it's history, but there's it kind of mixes in. And have you ever had someone get mad at you for your research? I bring this up because I figured out, I thought I connected the dots. There was a one-legged tightrope walker who fell in Corsicana and yeah. his grave just says rope walker. And I was going through all these newspaper archives and I kind of pieced together, I mean, how many one-legged tightrope walkers can there be? And um, I kind of figured out his name. And so I sent a little thing to the Corsicana Daily News and they ran a little thing about it. And then I got like a couple really angry emails from people. <laughs> And I'm like, I thought you'd be happy that I figured this out. One of them like was kind of maybe insinuating that I was being anti-Semitic. I'm like, I don't even know how you get that. And then the other one was just like, look here, Missy, I've lived here longer than you. <laughs> like, okay. You can't you can't pay attention to the peanut gallery. I, I guess to, not. I, well, I sent them is. both a little PDF with my newspaper clippings and they never got back. I, I, I took the higher road. I'm like, oh, well, have a nice day. That's what you have to do. It has, it has <laughs> happened to me. but um, it, Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? You think people, it's the... I don't know. It's always surprises me. Obviously, I wrote a book a little more controversial called "The 1910 Slocum Massacre in Africa, yeah. in East Texas," and I, I have had that black one. people upset with me. I had white people in the area oh, upset wow. with me, and it just, uh, you know, it's it can be tough. But you, but you know, brought it out though. It I take crazy. it serious. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you take the sort of mission seriously. You want to find yeah. out what happened. You want justice for the victims. Mm-hmm. Um, all kinds of stuff like that. So you just yeah. don't. You can't get 
you can't, you have to have a little bit of ego. You have to, because you have to believe in what you're doing. Yeah, you if do. You don't have that much to get out there. <laughs> yeah, if you're, if you're insecure or you're unsure of yourself, they're going to eat your lunch. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. so you have to, I know ego is not something you use. We all need when it. You talk we about it, you, you don't say like, you know, it's a good thing usually to have an ego, mm -hmm. but to uh, take on some of these, these, these mysteries and some of these big questions, you have to have confidence, you know, in your work and you have mm -hmm. to be serious about it. And uh, you can't let the, the boo, the, the, the boo patrol or what do they call it? The, the naysayers, yeah. you, you know, uh, the boo birds or the naysayers <laughs> stop you. Yeah, I think they're always going to be there. It's just sometimes they just surprise you. You're like, what? Why are you mad at that? I thought you'd get mad at this other thing. Oh, that makes you mad, whatever. But we do have a question from Debbie. She wants to know, is there something in Texas that you have heard about but have not seen and would like to or would like to write about? I've got a whole list. But she's asking you. <laughs> huh. Um, you know what? I don't know about that. I mean, I'm really – I've written about I've written about a lot of stuff. <laughs> I mean, I, I haven't uh, – I've I've never seen the uh, Marfa Lights actually. That's on my list too. That's but I don't know that I, I you know it's not like I mean I, I took a canoe trip down the Rio Grande in, in eighty with my dad for like thirteen days you know mm, how nice you know in sort of that area I mean I've seen lots of other things and uh, mm -hmm. so <sighs> the things that you what do they say about about really cool places like Paris. They said that by the by the time people heard about it being a, a mecca, a cultural mecca, by the time normal people heard about it, it was the scene was already over. Oh, uh -huh, and everybody's uh -huh. heard of the Marfa lot, Marfa lights. Very mm -hmm. few people have heard of the Saratoga light. The what? The <laughs> See, Saratoga I haven't heard, light. I haven't heard of it. It's north of Houston. What? And it's Bigfoot territory, right? Oh my! Okay, I'm writing it down. Saratoga okay. lot and it's called the Saratoga Ghost Road. And so I'm much more interested in what hasn't been documented than what has. Yeah. You can relate to that. Mm -hmm. You know, your book on the Santa Claus robber or mm -hmm. robbery. Um yeah. you know, that was nobody nobody's covered that ground, but the stuff, you know, sorry, but the Alamo mm -hmm. <laughs> the Alamo and even Crash at Crush, you know, has, has had some coverage. But mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. unless you got something new to contribute, you know. I, I, You've got to stay excited through the whole project yourself. Like, yeah. what, don't you love it when your research just takes a right turn? Because I kind of go in thinking, oh, I think I know what I'm going to find. And then, what? It goes over here? Oh, then I'm really, really, I was wrong. This is great. No, exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. the case, the story of the uh, the Spanish fort in Texas mm -hmm. Obscurities, I wrote about that for Texas Co-op Power First. And there was a new editor, not the original one. It was like, where are you? Where did you come from? But a new one. Oh, and okay. he, he was frustrated because he'd say, you need to get you need to get a quote from an expert, and I, I said, and this sounds now. Well, you probably you know me a little bit. You probably think I'm arrogant anyway, but I said, you know what? I am the expert. Oh, good for you. <laughs> There's right now. I mean, nobody. This is you know like some of the stuff you you've delved into. Mm -hmm. There are who studied it. I mean, all of a sudden, I'm sure you don't think you're. You know, I don't think I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm 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 no slouch, but. You know, I did the research, and mm -hmm. at, at that point, after a while, I know more about it than anybody who's ever written about it that I know of. And mm -hmm. I can't find an expert to comment. And yeah. they're like, well, you need to find it. <laughs> so I'm like, it's, it's ludicrous. It was very uh, upsetting. Okay, I'll get an alter ego. <laughs> you know, <laughs> spell your name backwards and interview. But you can get off into some of these, you know, you talk about, mm -hmm. I don't know, these rabbit holes you can go down into. Some of these stories really haven't had that much coverage, especially if it's like unpleasant history, you yeah. know, like the uh, Dead Man's Grave. You know the one I'm talking about? I Dead know. Man's Hole. Yeah, I was just there. Mm. Yeah. And, and I, mean, I, I wonder some of my... That's disturbing, mm -hmm. or, that's and, disturbing stuff. And here's the thing I recently discovered. Okay, so when I wrote my most recent book, Six Feet Under Texas, I did a huh. thing about, you know, the thing in... um. The people who were in um, comfort, that monument to the... To the, the, um, the free thinkers. <laughs> Yeah, that well, the the um, they were German immigrants who were um, union. True, uh, true to union. their union. Well, um, turns out I'm related to them. I did not know that. My mom tells me right before the book. Oh, honey, did you know that our relative? She tells me the whole story. I'm like, what? Because I was really upset when I was researching it. I was like, this is just crazy. You mean they were given a month to leave Texas and then this? I don't think they had that long. They, they were trying to escape. 
conscription and fought for the Confederacy. And yeah. Of course, they caught them at the Oasis and slaughtered mm -hmm. them. And just left their bones there. And then, like, yeah, I'm related to those guys. Yeah. And so wow. uh, when I went to Dead Man's Hole and I texted my brother a photo, he goes, geez, I wonder if any of our, because some of them were, were, you know, Confederate gangs through some, you know, Union people who were loyal to the Union, the Civil War down there, apparently, too. I was like, well, I guess I got to research this, too. I, I don't know much about it. I mean, I want to know more, but I was like, that's crazy. It's, it's just saw stuff. it last week. Mm -hmm. The yeah, uh, Kaiser well. burnout in Texas far and wide is about a group of, of folks. Oh, I was know, looking at that, and I was thinking the same thing. Like, oh, they yeah. said, You know, the guy, Warren Collins, he said, uh, and he was a cousin of the guy that the movie guy. Free, State of, Free State of Jones with mm -hmm. Matthew McConaughey. This guy in Texas oh. was cousin of that character or that man, and uh, they basically hit out in the big thicket because they said, that the basically civil war was ridiculous because it, it's just a rich man's rich man's war and poor man's fight. You know, if you oh, had 20 slaves, yeah. you didn't have to go fight. So yeah, people, yeah, if you could pay a certain amount mm -hmm. for the southern aristocracy, it's ludicrous. Mm. But they they've got us to do it many, many times over the decades, centuries. <laughs> yeah. Still. So well, and, and like the great hanging, you had a picture in there, and like I had I had only learned about that not very long ago either. I was just like, holy moly. Oh, here we got another question from Debbie. There used to be a very old newsreel they used to show at the beginning of movies when I was a kid of two steam engines crashing head on. I wonder if that's the crash you were talking about. I it might know. be. I can't speak to that. I haven't seen it, but uh, there was footage of it. There was footage. Yeah. I've never I've never found it. If she mm -hmm. has a has a oh, yeah. has a line on how to get that you know, that re newsreel because there was an Edison guy there filming it, but I just never had able, been able to find it. Man, that's nuts. Oh, well now Another are there mystery. any projects you want to tell people about before that we, I want to make sure I'm going to tell you guys, everybody go check out his books on Amazon. I've got a direct link. If you don't feel like typing ER bills in the search bar, there's a direct link in the description box below. I've only talked about topics in three of his books, but um, he's got so many more. And I even have more on my shelf. I just picked these three. I mm -hmm. kind of just wanted to start. I was just kind of in the weird mode, but I'm like, yeah, I could have pulled out some others as well. Well, I appreciate you having me on. It was fun. I appreciate you being on. Thanks for spending time. We've almost kept you an hour and a half. So unless someone else has another question, um, I just think it was great. Really fun catching up with you a little bit. And, um, let, and let like, me, let me say, let me say to your audience, hey, get out there. I mean, COVID's, you know, winding down. Get out there. These communities and towns and these towns that are no longer there, the ghost towns, the stuff on a map, you know, uh, or a road that you see on a map that doesn't connect to anything else, go down. Yeah. Go down. I mean, do, we spend most of our time just, you know, making a living, you know, do some living, have an adventure. It could be right down the county road. Yeah, right. look, look for a place with a weird name. Like, yeah. place like and go and try and figure out why we got a place called Wizard Wells nearby. How weird yeah. was that? Was there a wizard? Why is it called that? There were wells there. Anyway, just look on your own map and find something, and then write your. Doesn't own matter book. where you are. Yeah, it's great stuff. Exactly. Great to visit stuff. with you. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody. Gail saying thank you. Um, I think people enjoyed you and um, yeah, I don't know what your next project's going to be, but whatever it is, I'd love to have you on the show again anyway. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> you'll Maybe be back. we'll do one together. <laughs> That'd be fun. That would be a lot of fun. Take All care, right. ma'am. All right. Thanks everybody. Oh, here Debbie's saying thank you. Okay. Thanks everybody. I'm glad y'all enjoyed ER. We will have to have him back. I knew he'd be right up everybody's alley. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>